morning. How are you? Fine. How are you? Well, we appreciate being invited to come to visit your shop today. Good to see you. I would uh, uh, say we, we're happy to have you in this part of the country. You haven't always been here. No. You come from Auburn with a career in teaching, yeah. industrial engineering at Auburn University. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And uh, it, along the way, I assume that you've always been interested in old machinery. Always. Can't remember when I wasn't. And you've co collected quite a few pieces. So remember, it wasn't old machinery when I first started. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you have uh, been interested in old printing presses, printing. So well, that, that's real fascinating. So we appreciate being here today to see some of this. And I was just, as I walk up, I'm just really impressed with the, with the building, the, the way that uh, you recently built this. And we'll talk about yes. that a little bit more later, too. The man who built it is hammering in the back, putting an addition on because we didn't have enough room up here. And that's Mr. Larry Shockley. We want to talk Shockley. to him. We'll see if he'll speak to us. Well, uh, while we're standing here, what, what about this machine here? It does this as a combination machine. It looks it's, like. They called it a universal woodworker. It's kind of the shopsmith of 1910. The most obvious thing is the bandsaw, but it also had a jointer over here, a table saw. It takes a bigger blade than this, mm -hmm. but the table saw would have been in here. There were other attachments. I think there were a total of 14 to 16 attachments you could get with it. I do have some of them. There's a boring attachment out here. You put a drill bit in here, and then there's a table for it to ride for. Mm -hmm. It would have been typical, I think, in a small cabinet shop or where you wanted to send it out on a construction job. If you were a big contractor, I knew of one contractor in Auburn who had a similar machine. They pulled it with a gasoline engine. Uh, it belted up back here, but it ran everything off the of belts. Mm -hmm. it's somewhat portable then. Somewhat portable. Mm -hmm. Mind you, it weighs over a thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. Most of this is cast iron. Well, did this run off of a, either, like you say, a motor or a, a line motor. shaft? Right. Or, right. <clears throat> So you, you've uh, restored this and you've come... I'm working on it. Working on restoring. It's a work in progress. It's like you're doing a good job. Come in. Well, now that we're inside, Walter, I see a, a lot of interesting equipment and, and I'd like to hear about, about each one of them. But as I walk in, I notice a clock here on the wall and. I know that must have some history behind that. Would you tell us about that? Well, I have to think about it in a minute, but it came out of the Charleston and Western North Carolina Railroad, the yard office in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where I grew up. I didn't get it. I got it from the jeweler uh, who used to service it. So. And, I, and I also noticed a sign over the door here. Well, for a while I was in the mechanical engineering department in Auburn. Our department head have that sign made, and as it says, by order of D.M. Vestal, he meant it. So leave shop clean after each operation. So that's an order that you had to observe yeah. was order of yes. Then they said, do not spit on the floor. Smoking is forbidden, and your criticism of my work indicates an unscientific background. This tells you a little about the building itself. Well, Walter, there's someone else that uh, you'd like to introduce to us today that uh, had a hand in some of this. This is Larry Shockley from Belvedere, Metropolitan Belvedere, I should say, and he is a well-known local builder, I think considerable talent. And a member of the woodworkers. And a member of the woodworkers. And one reason you did not see us bringing anything to show and tell was we were working on this building, so this is our show and tell about two years. But I had a, some rough sketches of what the building should look like, and I told him it was going to have some heavy equipment in it. It could, might have a fire engine in it and a few machine tools, and you can see how that turned out. The fire engine's not here, but Larry built it heavy to carry a fire engine, and I think it 
turned out where it obviously is holding up the weight and it's also um, very pleasing to the eye for most of us. Mr. Shockley. Thank you. You gonna tell us a little about the door lock or some of the buildings? Did you make the hardware for the doors? Hardware first we started out uh, on a cold day here making the doors and the frames as, as the project went along, deciding uh, what we wanted to make it out of and how. All the doors that you see here are three ply. Hinges are handmade, hand bent on an old forge. And the pins that we put into our post frame is six inch. And uh, the hardware here on this door is very simple. You can turn this and you're unlocked. And you can push back and you can lock it. You notice this is made in a circle. And uh, we use C as a copy Clement. We put the handle in a C shape for ball. And the same thing is on the uh, front of the door. It only has one lock. And when we go back down on the outside, it will lock just like any other ordinary door. Well, did you make the latch on this front door also? Oh, yeah, we done, it, done that one too. It's designed a little differently. Just a little bit different. We had to make this a little bit bigger over here, a little bit heavier. And those still have the seat, though. Still got the seat, and also as a hand pull. We have no coils or latches on the outside. We had to come in the little door to work the big door. Mm -hmm. Now, very simple. Two halves. Counterbalance. Counterbalance. They can both go out together. Or we can bring them back together. How do you like that sound? I hope somebody to come in. Counterbalance, snow, and on this side here, these doors are three ply. And the casings and the framing here, uh, the framework is on six by six. And it's on a solid uh, concrete pour here. These hinges were also bent and made at my place. Uh, where we bent these at the shop and these hinges are somewhere close to five foot in width. It keeps it in place and keeps it because wood will crawl, it will stretch and will dry out. But so far in the years this has been here So it still works. No doubt. It's <laughs> good design and good craftsmanship, Larry. Thank you. I'm also interested in, uh, I'm seeing some Victorian uh, molding and, be and rosettes and beadboard and... Well, you see it. And y'all made all of that? Uh, yes. This, this is Papa 1x6. The uh, rosettes were run on the old label. Mm -hmm. The molding was run on a machine very similar to the molding machine. And then these base pieces, cliff blocks. Cliff blocks. Yes, thank you. <laughs> they were, well, let's see. This was done on a little delta table saw with a seared robot molding head. And this was done on the bandsaw back there. And that was that. The idea for these came from a building in McMinnville that was being restored and they needed some replacements. Some of them had been lost or the building had been remodeled. So I got the job of making the replacements and after I did that I kept a pattern. Always keep a pattern when you work. And it 
might come in useful later. So I think they did very well here. This just goes on and around and there you have it. Did y'all like the bead board? This bead board I put in a plug for Franklin County Lumber Company. Okay. Just gave them some money, you know, and right. they delivered it. But the bead board on the ceilings, we ran on a machine very similar to that. Mm -hmm. and it is, this is probably northern white pine, that's southern yellow yeah. pine. Mm -hmm. What about the flooring? The flooring, yeah. Uh, I went down to Davy Ashley's to get some, see about getting some oak flooring, and he said he would make me a good deal on some swamp maple. And, uh, I think it was a good deal. It's swamp maple. Did you tongue and groove this yourself? Uh, no. Okay. I have tried. Uh, actually, I would have had to carry it back to Alabama at that time. Right. I carried it up to Lewisburg. And there was a genius up there, one man uh, molding shop. He could make this, he could make the cutters for this. Mm -hmm. uh, NBC molding. NBC molding. NB Carter, molding for Carter. And maybe actually routinely since planing uh, tongue and groove work. Right. Did a very good job. One of the five four. Well, you know, I'm impressed how y'all stuck to a period type decorative uh, molding and, and all of the woodwork and uh, so really had a nice, nice effect. Well, I think Larry can build you anything. I want to know how to build this sort of stuff. And I don't do much building. He won't let me put things together. I, I can turn out the compounds, but he makes them fit. I mean, he does that well, too. So very well. Walter, that um, woodworking machinery is kind of down this side of the shop. Here. Pretty much on this side. <clears throat> some of it's quite old and some of it is not so old. This is a probably 1940s Delta table saw and it has done yeoman duty for us and building the building and other things. So you use all of your, most of your machinery I have work, in working order. I have need for and use mm -hmm. everything in here. Mm -hmm. Not every day. Time to time. Well, I notice there's a familiar lathe here. That you I think should know that about this lathe. I think this lathe is the oldest piece of power machinery in the shop. Uh, it 
go back to? Well, one, one interesting, interesting point of the lady that apparently it was uh, the maker made his own pattern and cast the pattern. I understand this was done in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it found its way to the uh, shop at the University of South in Swanee mm -hmm. and was used in their shop for a number of years. And the son of one of the uh, people that worked in the shop there uh, uh, ended up with it. And he gave it to uh, let us have it uh, provided we would put it back in, in working order. And you certainly uh, have done that. Uh, this, the uh, frame is made out of uh, some cypress that was came from a, a place in Chattanooga. Um, so you've got it all all back in, in working order. All of them, yes, I can go slow I'll get it all going Exactly a rotary machine. It's a foot-powered mortise. And I actually got this at the yard sale in Winchester, but it didn't have the wooden spring mechanism on the back, and it didn't come with any bits. And I've got to find a blacksmith friend to make some bits for it. Got it at least working. In the aid of an old illustration, figured out how the spring mechanism worked. And then I would say something about the drill press. Um, when I was a sophomore at Clemson College, all the engineering students had to take shop. And it's a sore point with me that they don't take shop in mechanical drawing now. But in shop in our sophomore year, we made a drill press. The Jacobs Chuck was purchased and a few other little, like pulleys and motor. I think the motor came off of a washing machine. We, uh, the casting was all done in the foundry at Clemson, and then the machine work was done. School of Engineering, Clemson College, building engineering shops. So that was your sophomore project. Three of us worked together on it. Unfortunately, my two partners didn't want any part of it. I was able to purchase it that utility. So, at least I have something to show for. What did y'all do your casting? We did some of the casting and some of them was purchased. Mm -hmm. Found it just up the road, so to speak. Yeah. And that was over 50 years ago, so I guess that would, would be an antique now. All of the older machines were driven by flat belt. Okay. Well, this is bandsaw, and to me it's sort of a piece of resistance. I don't use it very often, but you do need a big bandsaw occasionally. I didn't do the restoration on this one. It's uh, it was in pieces in a place in Oklahoma. And a friend of mine has gotten it from a funeral home in Oklahoma. They used to make their own caskets. And I started to Oklahoma to pick it up and picked up so much stuff before I got to Oklahoma, I had to return to Alabama, and the Smithsonian was preparing their centennial, their bicentennial display, which was a reproduction of the centennial display of 1876. And one of their molds, I guess you would call it, or ferrets, knew that I might have a knowledge of an old bandsaw, and so they would be glad to pick it up and restore it if I had to keep it for two years. So that was a good deal. They did, I did. They kept it 20 years and got it back. And it's set up and run and I occasionally use it. This is another old timer. It's a molding machine for wood. You feed a piece of stock in from the back and the feed rolls grab it. This is a chip breaking guard, and there's a cutting head on here with cutters that 
have a profile ground into them, and they rotate at about 3600 RPM. So the wood is passed under those and they turn out molding, or whatever pattern you may have. Actually, you can use it as a flat plane, but you can see it's only about mm -hmm. five inches wide, so it wouldn't do much planing. But pretty good little molding machine. It's very early, probably Civil War or just after. It has a wooden frame cast iron mantle, sort of like the lathe, made by the C.B. Rogers Company in Connecticut, Norwich, Connecticut, probably the 1860s, 1870s, and it is driven off the overhead shaft. This lever engages the feed, and we have to shift the belt by with a stick to get it started. Once it's running, you can run about a thousand feet an hour if everything goes well, but it doesn't always go, unfortunately. Nothing flies off in normal operation. Things will jam and knocks will feed in and fly out. Right. And you have to readjust them. A big step forward from doing molding and handling. The ceiling in this building and the trim around the windows was run on a very similar machine, only about 15 years younger. Let's say this one just has a single cutting head. The machine I used down in Auburn, North Solar, had four cutting heads. So big improvement. This is one of the newer pieces of equipment. I think it was in the wood shop at Auburn years ago. I bought it from a local man who purchased it. He had a shop for making pallets, so he used it for quite a while. Monarch Woodworking Machine, Model 41, American Sawmill Machinery Company, Hackettstown, New Jersey, USA. So, it's a 20 inch planer, fairly typical of the uh, 1920, 1930 period. Some of them were belt driven, this one happened to have a motor attached. Of course, it's three phase motor, which makes it a little odd to work with. But you feed the rough lumber in here. And it will munch right through it. And you can adjust the depth here. You have to sit down and the scale is here and it's not. Comes complete for the rest of the size. I see we're in the metal working area of your shop now. Yes, the opposite side from the woodworking, I'd say. My dad was a third generation machinist. He did not own the shop in later years. His father sold it, but dad stayed with the man who bought it. And this was one of the pieces of equipment that was in the shop when it was sold. And a couple of others, you know, this is a 1916 South Bend lathe. Originally driven from an overhead shaft that was converted to a motor about 1940, but still has a platform mm -hmm. drive. Although it's primarily a metal working machine, I have done woodworking on it. And Dad would not have approved of that, but uh, I've done it. This is a wheel that I machined not too long ago for John Lovett. Now, it started out as a rough casting. John made the patterns, the wooden patterns for it. And it goes on some machine that falls mill. And I drilled it, reamed it, and made a shaft, a mantle, so it can be mounted in the lathe. And I, it takes quite a while to get this in and center, but essentially the lathe turns the workpiece against a cutting tool, which would be in the carriage. This adjusts transverse position of the cutting tool and then there's an automatic feed or a hand feed that moves the carriage back and forth and makes you cut. The lathe is really considered the king of machine tools. It, it, it will do uh, primarily turning and uh, all machine tools remove metal. This one was for turning pieces like this but uh, you can bore, drill, or with a little practice and some attachments you can do milling that is flat work mm -hmm. so, and it is a flat dri a belt driven machine initially uh, it had a counter shaft over here about 1940 they had bought this from the south bend uh, 
Blade Works in South Bend, Indiana. They built the machine in 1916 and 1940. They upgraded it so that it could take an electric motor. Big, big step forward. If you're sufficiently clever, you can do threading on this machine. These are the change gears that have to be put on here to get the different threads. And I have done that, but I really prefer a little more modern machine for that. It's called a six foot south bend plate. Six foot being the length of the bed. Here's another job I did on the lathe. This is a casting in high strength aluminum for a connecting rod for an antique gas engine a man in Massachusetts has. Uh, I made the wooden pattern. A friend of mine did the casting. I don't do that. And then, knowing me, he said he'd make two castings because he figured I'd mess one up. I've gotten started on this one. It's been machined again in the lathe. Put it in the four-jaw chuck and drill it, bore it, and ream it. And now it will, the next step, it will go to the milling machine, which requires a different setup. That's typical of lathe work. But something else I can do on this lathe, and I have it set up to do the little wooden blocks that go around the corners and the doors and windows. Rosettes. Rosettes. Uh, this is just a piece of rough stock, and that's one I okay. roughed out. Okay. I won't comment on the quality of the work, but it will at least show the the machine does. We'll get to that. This jaw, the four jaw chuck, is, I have it stationary more or less as I do this. These two lock this in place. So, this is a standard boring bar holder for a lathe, and I made this cutting tool ground that out to give a profile of one half of the rosette pipe. This is a tool I actually used to make the rosettes on the building. I've got this sort of center. Let me see where I want it to be. It cuts about where I want it. Turn the blade on. Let's tighten the belt. See my center. a little bit slower speed for wood turning, so I'm going to put this on a larger pulley here, small one down here, and then what I'll be doing is feeding this tool into this rotating block. If you see me suddenly fall on the floor, you'll know that my father's ghost has come and hit me over the head for using his lathe for such a job. Scraping operation. Point out this is a piece of rough wood that's a little on the green side so it does not give you a good finished cut. But I would get certainly a better cut than that on the dried piece. And then while you have it in the lathe, just back that where your hand won't but get thrown back into it because it is a bit sharp. Let's sand paper and sand. I notice a, a South Bend Precision lathe here. This is a more recent acquisition. This is sort of the grandbaby of this one. This is 1916, this is 1953. Dad didn't have anything to do with this. He would like to have had it, but uh, I bought it about three or four years ago. And it has the advantage of just turn it on, it plugs into the wall. And as you see, there's a piece of brass stock in here. I'm going to look at it. Take the depth of cut to within thousandths of an inch. This will engage the feet. It's 
taking off about 15,000 metal. Pretty slow way to feed. To me, this is a modern machine. In fact, if you plug it into a wall socket, you can go with it, it's a big advantage. Of course, when you have pieces from Falls Mill, I don't think we could do that uh -huh. on this. It takes the bigger machine. I recognize this as a horizontal milling machine. You're recognizing correctly. It's a 1905-1906, probably. Uh, a little horizontal mill. It has a cutter and it's set up in the wrong direction. It's set up to mill a flat on a shaft right now. Very good for milling flat surfaces and the occasional keyway. If you're sufficiently clever, you can cut gears on it. I do have the dividing head, but I don't think I want to get into gear cutting. It's a basic metal working machine. And I think in very good condition. It's also run off of the overhead belt system, which is typical of the early 20th century shops. Well, I noticed that we have shapers in woodworking, but there are also shapers in metalworking. This is true. This is a small shaper, a bench shaper, if you will. This one happens to be on its own stand. It's about a seven and a half inch shaper, which means that the maximum stroke can be seven and a half inches. Shapers are a dinosaur these days, but they do have the use, and like the milling machine, many of the things that are performed on the horizontal mill can be done on the shaper. You can cut gears, you get a surface true. It has a round head that goes back and forth, unlike the shape of that wood shape goes rapid speed. This one is another blade in the wall and all she does. The work piece would be on this table. I don't have anything set up in it because the vice is in the middle of the machine. I have one vice that will work on the human machine. I'm not going to try to run two of these machines at one time. This was not in your bed, so. This is a little vertical steam engine. It's rated about one and a half to two horsepower. Unfortunately, it's not powerful enough to run the shop. I'd like to be able to run my shop with a steam engine. I do have a bigger one, but more about that later, perhaps. Uh, these are very popular for small shop. Uh, this one is rigged right now, so it will run on air, I think. Let's see. Yeah, 
Come back that, in a year, we'll have a big one out back that drives everything. That is Maybe. A, yeah. You're going to die with your little one out there? Or different no, I've got a, one that sits on foundation. Oh, I would love to put it up, really, but I don't know if I'll do it. You're going to put it out there and you should Maybe. It? We're still just, I've sold the property in Alabama, so I'm having to make some decisions about what I'm going to keep, what I'm going to move, what we put at Falls Mill, blah, blah, blah. Larry, I noticed, that, are, are these leaves on the floor here? Yeah, there's some leaves we put down here in this concrete and we finished it on the last counter. Well, would you tell me about why they're there and how they're, what is it? Well, we decided we wanted a trademark here and didn't want no stamps or no names or no, uh, dates or anything. So uh, we kind of measured this off the best we could here. The center leaf here is maple. And we went out and got these leaves early in the morning. And uh, we put them in warm water, let them get nice and soft. Then at about in our working in trailing down in our finishing stages, we, we put these in, trail them in the left. Well, Walter, this has always been a special interest of mine, the steam engine. And uh, I know you did a lot of restoration work on bringing this up and Getting it running. And you made the smokestack. I actually had the front of the boiler off, the front tube sheet out, and slithered back in there. Uh -huh. Check things out and inspect it. Wasn't so bad going in the boiler, but getting back out without any help. But it's uh, rated at six horsepower. It would be ideal for pulling a small threshing machine or mm -hmm. Shingle mill is a little bit like the sawmills. They made a bigger one for sawmills. Nothing that built this. And it's in fully restored condition. It runs fine. I know it's just uh, like last weekend you took it to Fedball, I believe. Yeah, we had to go with Fedball. This rigging here is pumping water into the water. Mm -hmm. I usually have a Jack Daniel barrel here with water in it. What kind of fuel do you use? Wood. 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 Mistakes from the wood shop. Bits and pieces. Of course, it's taking the power off the big pulley on the flywheel is also a pulley. It has a flyball governor. It's just open the throttle wide open, and then the governor takes over and hits a load, it will open up and automatically feed more steam to it. Uh huh. It was very popular late 19th century, early 20th century when the gasoline engines came out. Hit and miss, pop pops. That replaced it. Well, I understand you've got a, you, you do have a larger one back at Auburn? I have a considerable larger one. Mm -hmm. Home water for it. Well, I'm anxious to see that someday. It has a seven foot flywheel. Seven foot. Seven foot. Seven foot. Seven foot. Seven foot. Seven foot.